and welcome to another edition of Montpelier Connection. I'm Mike Merwicki, the state representative for the Wyndham Ford District of Putney, Dummerston, Westminster. It's December and we're getting ready, ready for the January session that's going to be starting on January 2nd, actually. Uh, New Year's being the first on a Monday, and then that Tuesday we're back to work in the State House. Today's show is going to be a show that focuses on an issue that hasn't been getting the attention that we feel it deserves. It's connected to the opioid epidemic and it, what, what happens to the children of addicted parents. Uh, specifically, we're going to be looking at foster care and the foster care system and how that need right now is greater than the foster families that are out there to do it. We have three guests today and I'm going to ask each of you to go along, introduce yourself and your role in that foster care system. Okay. I'm Sue O'Brien. I'm the District Director with Family Services. Our office is here in Brattleboro. We serve all of Wyndham County um, and I work closely with Michelle. Uh, who is our lead person for foster care and also with the social workers who are responsible for the kids um, and their parents and, and working with them. Mm -hmm. I'm Michelle Colburn and I am um, the resource coordinator in the Brattleboro uh, DCF office. So that means you help find foster homes and whatever? I help oh. retain and support foster, foster families so I'm always always out there trying to recruit new new families. Yeah, good. I'm Tina Bills, mm -hmm. and I've been a foster parent since 2009. Uh -huh. Well, Tina, I'm going to go right to you then. Mm -hmm. um, you've been doing this for a while. Uh, how many children over the years have you fostered? Somewhere, probably around a dozen. Yeah, yeah. And it sounds like you've adopted some of those? Yes, we yeah. just did our final adoption for our third adoptee. Yeah. And you have children of your own before the foster children? I do, yeah. yes. We have what we call the bigs and the littles. Uh -huh. Three of um, my own that are older and grown, and then these three little ones. Yeah. Um, Sue, how has this landscape changed, say, over the last 10 years? Um, how many children did we have in custody, say, 10 years ago, and how many do we have now? Do you have those numbers? Um, I don't have the numbers from 10 years ago. I think it would probably be around 60 or 70. I know in 2014, uh, which is only now three, three and a half years ago, there were 90 children in custody. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to know, as of today, we have 162 children 162. Uh, in custody. So yeah. it's, it's probably at least doubled uh, in 10 years. Yeah. Um, if not a little bit more. It is, is it your sense that the opioid epidemic is one of the great drivers for this increase? Yes, um, our central office recently took a little survey um, and I think it only showed about 50 something percent of children coming into care directly from um, substance abuse issues. But in talking with workers, there's a lot of other things that they think contribute, that it contributes to like issues with uh, housing um, and the lack of housing um, and you know neglect because of the parents drug use and so sometimes it's not the main reason but when we get involved and start to look further uh, it becomes clear that it's, it's one of the factors. Yeah. Michelle your role is to help find foster homes? Yes. So what does that look like say somebody wanted to start the foster home. What's the process? So they would give me a call and then um, I would talk with them over the phone to see what their, you know, I like to match, put matching together and just answer any questions that they may have, find out what what age would fit best in their home and then I would mail them out an uh, informational packet. I'd ask them to fill it out and then I would make a date and go to their house mm -hmm. and I would talk more with them, gather all their information. Um, I would bring it back to the office. We would do background checks and then I would mail it all their information up to licensing mm -hmm. and then licensing will mail out a packet of more information to them and fingerprints and set a date to come out and visit with them. So it's a pretty involved process and not anybody can. And, um, you do background checks, right? We do. Yeah, it's pretty important that people know that they're right. The children we take into custody are going to be put into safe, stable places. Right. 
Yeah. Right. So we would we would want to make sure that there was no um, felonies of for child abuse, spousal abuse. Um, so we'd look deeply into that. And fingerprints. We'd like to to have fingerprints done. Mm -hmm. And then, do you visit the homes at that point, or? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yep. And I look, I look for um, to make sure that there's a bedroom for a child. They can share so with the same gender. They can share okay. as, um, as long as that um, the same gender is under 18. Yeah. Um, I look for a door for privacy. I look for um, a window in case there was an emergency for an emergency exit. Um, I would. Um, make sure that they're financially stable. Um, they can be um, civil union, they can be a couple, they can be married. Um, those are the things that I would look for. I'd make sure there's a smoke detector. Mm -hmm. I'd make sure there's fire extinguisher. Um, those are the things that I look for. Yep. Yep. Now, how are we doing right now? Let's, have you ever had a situation where child came into custody and you had nowhere to put them? Tonight is one of those nights. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, I would say I've done this work for almost 40 years, uh, starting here in Brattleboro. And about a month ago was the first night that I thought we were going to have to rent a hotel room for staff to stay with a child because we couldn't find a foster home. Yeah. Uh, we ended up, I think, finding a home in Brandon. Uh, and the worker had to drive the child pretty much in the middle of the night up there. Which is about two and a half um, hours yeah. away. And then turn around the next day probably and go back and get them. So um, as I said, you hear stories about that kind of in the large cities or, you know, or um, departments actually having children in the office overnight. Um, and yeah, we've come close, close mm -hmm. to that, which is pretty scary in terms of um, how that child must, must feel. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, you've been doing this for several years now. Uh, can you share a little bit about why you got into trying to uh, take care of children in foster care? Well, initially, my older kids were getting older, and yeah. they were one was out on its own, uh, one was in college, and I had one that was a junior in high school, have a big house, yeah. and uh, it was too early to be an uh, uh, empty nester. Mm -hmm. So. I love kids, it's what I've always done um, and supported. I knew there was a bit, huge need, so I looked into it and my husband was on board and that was the beginning of the end. <laughs> and, and you take care of children as your job as well, right? Yes. Yeah. So that is an amazing love for children there. Um, and actually that's the reason why um, when I first got into this, I was um, in another in another job, and tr once we had um, become foster parents, mm -hmm. our daughter was special needs, yeah. and so we needed a special child care provider to take care of her, and there weren't any um, in the area, so I decided that I would fix that, and okay. that's why I opened up an early ch learning center, mm -hmm. um, was because it was there was a huge need for her and other kids just like her. Yeah. There's been a, a, a lot of new research now on childhood trauma and its, its lasting effects, the adverse childhood experiences scale. Um, have you seen how trauma affects some of the children that you've taken care of? And, and Most definitely. Um, yeah. Our daughter is, uh, was in a bad situation. Um, she came to us at four years and five months and she had a lot of trauma in her life. Um, she has some brain damage, and you know it's it's been really tough. It's life. It's a lifetime. Um, it's going to be a lifetime experience for her. Yeah. So we have to find new ways to reach her and new ways to help her. And um, it's it's hard. It's hard for her. It's hard for many people. Mm -hmm. um, but we do it, and you know she's so much better than she ever was. Yeah. So we're thankful for those those milestones. Yeah. And how old is she now? She's 12. She's 12. Wow. Yes. So we've had her for a while. Yes. Um, <clears throat> is, is there anything you can share about the, the ups, the downs, the, <laughs> the sense of satisfaction you get? That for somebody who's watching mm -hmm. and contemplating whether to get into being a foster parent, um, what are some of the 
most rewarding parts of it? I say it's the toughest job you'll ever love. Yeah. Um, seeing, seeing them achieve, seeing them being able to do even little things that they couldn't do when they first came to you is amazing. Yeah. Um, there's so much love and their kids are so resilient and so forgiving. And you know, you give them the boundaries and you give them the, the expectations and support them and they, they just do so well. They soar with that. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's awesome. It's awesome to see firsthand and to see what a difference one person can make. Um, it's really, it's really amazing. And it, it is the toughest job you'll ever, you'll ever love. I mean, the reward is, is not monetary. It's, mm -hmm. it's in seeing those kids achieve. It's seeing what they can become. Um, it's really, it's quite amazing. Um, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of people about being foster parents. I strongly believe in it. And I think there's a huge need and these kids are not, they're in this position for no fault of their own. Yeah. Um, so it's time to take a step back and show these kids that there's a community that loves them and there's a community that will support them. Um, and many people have told me that they don't, the reason why they don't do it is because they don't want to give the kids back. They feel that they would be attached. And what if I have to give the kids back? And initially I kind of felt that same exact way, but now that I've been doing it for a while and I take a step back and I think if I can make a difference in a child's life for one day yeah. and give that child a feeling of safety, and a feeling of belonging and knowing where they're going to sleep and what they're going to eat. And if I can do that for one day, make a difference, why wouldn't I do that? Yeah. To not do that is selfish. So it is hard if they have to go, but you've given them something to, to, to know that there's, different, there's a difference out there and that somebody cares and somebody will support them. And to me, that's, that's all worth it. Um, I don't think anybody could, could share anything better as to why it's worthwhile to get involved with this. Are there parts of this that you didn't expect that were even harder than you, you figured before you started this? Most definitely. I think when you first become a foster parent, and if you've been a parent before, your natural reaction is, I'm just going to treat them like my own kids and they'll be fine. But these are kids that have trauma. These are kids that have had neglect or trauma. You can love them like your own kids, but you can't treat them like your own kids. There's certain things that you have to do with them. There's certain criteria that they need to know, they need to understand. Um, so there's, there's a way. You have to work with different people to figure out what works best for them. Um, and each child is different. So you know, trauma looks different in different kids. And trauma can look different with the same child the next day, because it's, it's whatever it is at that moment. Um, so a lot of that was, was a learning curve for me to mm -hmm. be like, okay, I have to step back and I have to figure out what works for this child. Yeah. Is, is that something, Michelle, that you help parents with is understanding that the children more than likely have, have trauma at some level on the spectrum and, and what they can expect? Yep, I do. And I also, we have support services through UVM who has a lot of training. So when you become a foster parent, we, you take a Foundations 1 class first, and then you take a Foundations 2. And, then, and that is in a partnership with UVM. Are those parenting classes or just human development? There, it, it's, it's a gamut of, of, of it all. Yeah. So it's, it's, tra it's training our foster parents the court system. Yeah. It's training them trauma. Um, it, it runs for everything that we think that you're going to deal with with a child in your care. We try to touch on all those bases. Yeah. 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 And is that something that's ongoing? It is ongoing. Yeah. There's many classes that you can take through sure. through UVM. There's Foster Parent College um, that you can take online, mm -hmm. um, and it's free. Um, and they offer a lot, a lot of variety there. Um, and then UVM extends out other classes that I can offer foster parents if they want them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So you keep pretty busy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are the other kind of things that you support? The, uh, so the we, um, we have a support group. Yeah. Um, and we try to keep it running. Sometimes it's really difficult for foster parents to attend it, so it kind of gets laggy sometimes. Yeah. But we're, we're ready to up and run when yeah. people need it. Um, there's also um, 
um, UVM runs a Voices from the Table blog, and you can go in there and read about trauma, and they can help you out through the blog sometimes. Um, we have the Vermont Foster Adoptive Association um, that foster parents can belong to. There's a big training in April, and um, foster parents go for a whole weekend of training and workshops and institute and networking amongst themselves, which is very nice. Um, and then we have mentoring foster parent to foster parent. So when a foster parent first begins, we try to set them up with a more skilled seasoned foster parent. So if they need to other questions answered, they can call them and it's more comfortable. Yeah. Now, uh, Michelle mentioned the courts. Now, uh, the system works. It's not just that DCF sees a problem and they go in and take a child. Mm -hmm. The process, maybe you could run us through the process a little bit because everything really goes through the courts. Right, I mean, we have families that we work with that are never court involved. We yeah. get a report, um, we go out, we work with them, uh, we try and connect them to services and we feel that the parent is gonna be able to, to safely care for the child. If, however, we think the child's in danger, um, we will uh, write an affidavit outlining what our concerns are but then that has to go to the state's attorney's office for review and they have to approve it mm -hmm. um, and then file it with the court and then there would be a hearing uh, that would be set and all the parties, the parents, the child would have attorneys appointed, the child would have a guardian ad litem um, and those hearings are what really determines what's going to happen if mm -hmm. the child will come into custody or stay at home with the parent. They might stay at home uh, and the judge might uh, impose certain orders or expectations on the parent mm -hmm. uh, and give them an opportunity to be able to do that. Um, some parents are successful with that. Uh, other parents aren't able to and then we might go back again and, and the child might come into custody. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a lot of checks and balances on, on, on what we do. We're the ones I think that initially sound the alarm but um, then all those other people um, get involved. And right. I will say, I think in this county, we have very um, active and very committed um, state's attorneys, attorneys, guardian ad litems. Um, they, the numbers have really strained all of our systems, the court system and, and everyone, but they're a very, we may not always agree, but they're a very caring, committed group of people that uh, work in the system. Yeah. Now, Foster parents are involved in that once a child is taken into custody? Foster parents can't be involved in the initial hearings, mm -hmm. um, but they can become involved later on um, and have their opinions and point of views uh, heard mm -hmm. um, at the court. And we should always be um, you know, contacting them and finding out yeah. from them how the child's doing and, and what they feel even uh, without going into court. Now, for some people, court can be an intimidating process, so is that something you help the foster parents get ready for if they have to get involved at all? Yes, I, as Michelle said, I think we try and explain it, but it is a pretty complicated system, and I think until you've been through it a few times, um, it's really hard to, to understand. Um, and, you know, we might have a child that comes into custody, and the judge returns them within a day or two. Yeah. Um, and that can be surprising, I think, for some new foster parents. So we try as much as we can to, to be clear about that. But sometimes when we're initially placing a child, say it's late at night and uh, you're really just focused on getting the child to the home and getting them comfortable, we may not do um, all that we can in terms of explaining the process. Mm -hmm. but. Um, you know, we do our best. And I think what's happened too is in this area, and I think throughout the state, a lot of our experienced foster parents have adopted children. Um, and so a lot of the foster parents coming in are brand new. Yeah. And it does take a while until um, they become familiar both with DCF and the court system and um, visits. And, you know, there's a lot of different pieces that, um, you know, come into play. Mm -hmm. You said you have fostered nine different children? About a dozen. About a dozen, yep. And when that happens, uh, do you get a call in the middle of the night sometimes or a call in the morning asking, can you take a child today? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, there's an array of different things. I mean, I've had them call and say, we need you in an hour. Yeah. Um, can you come down to DCF? 
Um, I've gone to Dartmouth before and picked up a baby in Dartmouth. I've been to the police department and picked up a toddler at the police department. Um, so I, you just, you never know. It's just yeah. that phone call and then can you do it? And you know, you have to be ready to make that commitment yeah. because if not, they have a job to get that, the, that child or those children placed. So you have to kind of be ready. Yes, I will or, or no, call me back. And before I have said, call me in an hour if you, you haven't got somebody else and try to rearrange what's going on and, mm -hmm. and see if I can help out that way. But you never know when that call is gonna come in or who it's gonna be or how many it's gonna be um, or what the situation is. And have you done respite care as well? I have. Yeah. And Michelle, can you talk a little bit about what, what respite is and how that's another option that people can help with? Sure. Respite is a time with, if you want to help out a foster family, kind of rejuvenate themselves, um, get a little bit of rest. Um, and sometimes it could be so they could have a date night. Sometimes it could be for the weekend. So. Um, it's a great time to make a connection with that child. So if these, if the foster parents want to go out again, they can go back to you. So it's a familiar face, yeah. and it's a great way to grow connections with foster children. Yeah, and that's something else that you. Yes, they can would call be, me, and yeah. and sometimes I have I have foster I have respite providers who take kids skating, teach them how to knit, um, whatever their little niche is, yeah. and I know I'll have a foster child who would love to kind of fit into that. Uh -huh. so, yeah. um, can you share the phone number they would call now? Would it just be the, the office, or is there a specific it, phone number? It would be the uh, DCF office phone. So sure. it's 802-257-2888. All right. And then there'd be a phone tree that they'd go through and try and they'd ask for Michelle? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Sure. Mm -hmm. And they will, they'll put that up on the screen oh, good. later, and I'll ask you again at the end of the show. OK. So. Um, you mentioned a baby. Mm -hmm. I think many people are unaware of the number of babies that have been coming into custody mm -hmm. lately. Can you speak mm -hmm. to that, Sue? Well, I think, again, that's connected to the uh, substance abuse so issues. So these are addicted babies, usually? Well, they may be, or they may be, you know, infants or that have been home for a while. Uh, but the younger the child, I think the greater risk they, they're at if their parent uh, really is addicted and not in treatment. Um, and may not be able to care for them. I mean, we know people um, can become sick if, um, if they're not able to get the drugs or they're uh, really somewhat fixated on where they're gonna get the drugs and not necessarily able to really focus on the needs. And so if it's an infant or a toddler, um, you know, they're often not in daycare, they're not in school, uh, they're not able to take care of themselves. And so uh, we have seen the increase uh, is more in the in the younger kids, mm -hmm. just because they aren't able uh, to care for themselves. Um, yeah. Is that different than it was five, ten years ago? Yeah, initially I think it was more adolescents. Um, yeah. We had um, probably the, uh, there were more adolescents and older children in custody mm -hmm. and not so many young children. And again, we do everything possible, uh, recognizing, you know, kids and parents and the need to bond and, and to be there and uh, we want people to know that you know our goal is really to get the parent into treatment um, to try and identify if there's other supportive people relatives friends who can help um, but the bottom line is if they can't uh, then we are concerned about uh, what's happening uh, with the young children especially yeah uh, children take a lot of time and effort babies even more, uh, does that complicate your job a little bit more or it, a lot? It does, because if they come in under six weeks, yeah. then um, they, they can't go to daycare, so I need a stay-at-home parent. Um, visits are usually five times a week, um, Monday through Friday. Even parental visits. Parental visits, yeah. yeah. And um, so that's kind of difficult. If they're coming in without daycare, it's mm -hmm. finding daycare for them. Um, and that's, that's really difficult also. Um, and daycare, daycares are full. Yeah. So that can, so looking for a, a foster family who stays home is a luxury, um, but it's a hard thing because everyone needs to work. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's hard, yeah. yeah. And, and that's still a great need though for those who are, who are looking in here. It is a great uh, need. Those who are looking to take on an infant. Yep. 
Yeah. And we do cover the cost of the daycare, yeah. so that's not mm -hmm. something people have to be concerned about. But as Michelle said, it really is just finding one. Or maybe the child's been in a daycare uh, here in Brattleboro, uh, but the home is in Brookline. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to uh, figure out either the transportation or can we identify um, a home. If we're not sure if the child's going to stay in custody, we might want to try and keep them in the same yep. daycare until we know more. Yeah. Um, uh, f from your perspective, uh, you've taken care of infants, and uh, are there greater challenges with infants coming in? Do you recognize infants who, who seem different because of the trauma that they've been through? Yeah, uh, you know, infants are a lot of work anyways. Um, the infant that I had that was 10 weeks old came with seven broken ribs. Um, so there was a lot of extra work with that. You know how to how to carry him, how to feed him, how to um, make sure that he was comfortable. Um, he had failure to thrive, so it was every two hours I'd set my alarm to wake him up. <laughs> it goes against everything they always say: let a sleeping baby sleep. <laughs> Not in this case. So every two hours, getting up and feeding him. Um, and I work full time, so it was oh. it was some foggy mornings. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it is a lot of work. It's not it's not a cakewalk. Yeah. Um, but again, it's so worth it um, yeah. to see that that growth is is amazing, and it happens quickly. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a lot of work, but worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the children that you have now, you have a big family, mm -hmm. and and there's a term for when families. Uh, joined together through marriage that we use called blended families. Mm -hmm. um, how has it been, been blending your, your bigs and your littles? Uh, it's been awesome. Yeah. Uh, my bigs are great and they take their job very seriously. Yeah. Um, so they do a lot of, um, my oldest son plays basketball with the youngest son. He comes home for games and basketball season just started as a matter of fact. So he's ready to go hold up his signs and mm -hmm. cheer him on. Um, my oldest daughter is, I mean, she's coming home and they have the countdown for when she's coming home from South Carolina. Uh -huh. um, they absolutely love each other. Oh, that's great. Um, and there's no difference between them. I mean, they're old enough where they understand and um, they've been around enough. They, they've grown up with it. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's really a great, a great relationship. Yeah. Uh, we've only got a couple minutes left. Um, is there anything we haven't covered or that you'd like to share for people who might be considering fostering a child? Um, your experience, and I want to say that it's just incredible to hear the, the story of the, the amazing love that you've had for these children and, and uh, bringing, bringing them into a, a better world. Um, so thank you. And, thank and, you. Um, anything you want to share with people? Um, I think the biggest thing is you don't think you have to be perfect to be a foster parent. I mean, foster parents are foggy, they're tired, they're hungry. Um, you don't have to be perfect to be a foster parent. You just have to have a heart, a big heart full of love, um, some patience, mm -hmm. and um, don't be afraid to use your resources. There's lots of people out there to talk to. There's lots of support. Um, there's different ways to get your questions answered. Um, take a chance. Um, if you love kids, you're, and you're not gonna, you're not gonna do the wrong thing. Yeah. So it's um, been totally worthwhile for you. Yes, it's been very worthwhile. Yeah. Great. Michelle, is there anything else you would add? Sure. If if anyone has time to give to a foster child, um, they need rides home from basketball games. They need rides to basketball games. They need uh, transportation to keep their education stable so they can remain in the district where they where they're coming from so we we need um if you can't foster that's you there's so many other ways yeah. so you could respite or you could offer transportation or you could share a hobby with with a foster child so there's so many other ways that you can be involved without becoming a foster parent sure and again how would people get in touch with you you'd call me at the office michelle colburn 802-257-2888 all right thanks number three 
Number three. Yeah. yeah. After the number. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Sue, any closing um, remarks? No, I mean just uh, I think what Tina said. It's it's challenging, but it's very rewarding. And these are these are really beautiful kids that, um, as you said, um, this isn't their doing, um, and they really um, they need they need people to care for them um, and to step up, and we'll do everything we can to to support people who are willing to do that. Um, and hopefully this will lead to at least more interest and in, uh, people knowing that uh, we have kids out there who really, uh, who really need them. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Thank you all for your work. Thank you. And, and thank you for tuning in. As you can see, uh, from the start of the show, we talked about how we wanted to put the story out there that there's an opportunity for you if you want to foster, if you want to provide respite, or just volunteer and help. And uh, the number will come up, come up again on the screen. So thanks again to the people here at BCTV, and we'll see you next time.